So our text tonight will come from Matthew chapter 5. You used to be reading one verse. This time we get three. I'm going to start with verse 10. And it says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. What a way to end our study on a blessed life. Persecution. God is good all the time. He really is. Well, a study of the Beatitudes is actually a study of our attitude, our character, if you will. And it's what God wants us to present and wants to be present in the lives of all of his followers. We used to have a man in Kokomo, and he had a little lapel pen, and it said, attitude is everything. You know, you think about it, attitude can change a lot from defeat to success to, you know, you can be doing everything right and the attitude gets bad and all of a sudden that whole situation gets turned around. Attitude really is critical. And these beatitudes really are looking at our attitude towards situations in life. So we want to do with these characteristics what Jesus Christ wanted to do was develop characteristics that are going to result in a blessed life. And we've talked about that. That's not blessing as we think of with laughter, and that's not blessing as far as worldly pleasures or worldly prosperity. I mean, a lot of times if we think of being blessed, we think of that person that has everything or that person that just life seems to be easy for them all the time. And as we've studied these, I hope you've come to understand that's not what God really expects of us. That's not the life he really wants us to have, and that's not really the blessed life, even though that is the life that everyone is really in our instincts, as far as our flesh, that's what we think we need and what we want. So we as Christians instead get to experience joy. We get to experience hope in situations and circumstances that it doesn't matter what the outward circumstances are. We still have that joy and we still have that peace that only comes from God. And then this last step tells us that if we achieve all of that everything else that we achieved in the last steps and we have that right attitude then all of a sudden we're going to find that instead of what we think of as blessing instead we get opposition as our lives and our attitudes are aligning with god and with his kingdom with the teachings of his kingdoms we're going to find ourselves out of favor with everything that is aligned to this world and in fact we're even going to find that opposition is going to come from everything in the kingdom of satan and all of his forces so i'm not talking about we're talking about blessing but we're talking about a blessing in an entirely different concept even at this level than what we talked about last week in this final beatitude jesus is saying there's a blessing in the opposition in the suffering and in the persecution that results in our lives that are lived for christ I know what you're probably thinking, because I, when I started to study this, I felt the same way. You know what? If it's all right on this one, I'll just go ahead and pass. When you really want to talk about persecution, you know, that's it just, you know, maybe I don't necessarily need that last step. You know, if, 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 if you can give me the easy life, I, I'm, I'm still good. Anybody with me on that? You know, we're all human, so we understand that. But out of all the Beatitudes, I want to point out this is the only one that Jesus em emphasized it by stating it twice. In fact, this is the only one in which he transitioned from saying, blessed are they, talking about people in general. And all of a sudden he said, blessed are ye, blessed are you. Almost like he wants to make sure that we understand that he really intends for this to be applied in our lives. He must have realized that his followers are going to have just a pretty hard time grasping and accepting this one. So I guess my work's cut out for me tonight as well. But he not only does he repeat it twice, but he also instructs them to, as well as knowing that you're going to get all this, but by the way, this is how I want you to respond. I want you to rejoice and be exceeding glad. Think about that. Now, as a rule... We don't really know how to suffer and at the same time rejoice and be glad. Now, you know, when I'm going through a situation, I can say, 
uh, right now my body is, is wearing me out and I can't wait until I get to feeling better and then I'm going to rejoice and be glad. You know, I'm going through that financial situation. I can't wait for, for the job situation to turn, that next paycheck to be there. And I can't wait. And then I'm, I'll really rejoice and give God the glory for what he's done at that time. You know, as far as those situations and those problems of life, you know, rejoice and be glad is something we think of as after that's all past. And that's not exactly what he's talking about with this. In fact, he's not really even talking about those situations that we consider just the suffering of this life. He's really talking about another level of persecution. Everyone suffers. Everyone in life is going to suffer. That's a foregone conclusion. You might as well just accept it. In fact, you all probably have already as well as me. Live life long enough and heartache's going to come. Live lo life long enough and there will be a financial situation. Can I get a witness? Uh-huh. If you live lo life long enough, death will visit. If you live life long enough, there will be family struggles and there will be relationships that go south. That's life. Suffering is a part of the human condition. And the Bible tells us this. Job chapter 14 verse 1 says, Man that is born of woman is a few days. And guess what all those days are going to be full of? Trouble. But just in case you thought that was just this man in, in the darkest days of his life that was writing this, the psalmist, you know, the one that has all the positive things to tell us in Psalm chapter 90, verse 10 reminds us, the days of our years are three score years and ten. You're going to live about 70 years, and if by reason of strength you might get 80 years, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow. You figure you might live 70 years, you might live 80 years, that's a blessing. Well, guess what? All of those years are going to be filled with trouble and sorrow. After that, it's going to be cut off and we fly away. As long as we're alive on this earth, we're going to suffer. Man, I'm giving you all the positive tonight. I, you, know, you guys should really be enjoying this. But there's a difference, let me tell you, between the normal suffering of life and suffering for the cause of Christ. Everybody's going to suffer, but not everybody suffers for the cause of Christ. Jesus makes a clarification that this, for the sake of Christ, he wants his disciples to understand there's going to be suffering that's going to be for righteousness' sake, and it's going to be for his sake. Now, he was speaking to his apostles. He was speaking to some people, and church history and tradition records that many of the disciples paid the ultimate price in their suffering. Let me just read and remind you about some of the apostles, the, what, the, what the Fox's Book of Martyrs has to tell us about them. James, the son of Zebedee, the elder brother of John, you know, in Acts chapter 12, he was the one that was beheaded. They cut off his head. It's said that on his way to being martyred, James, this accuser, was so impressed by his courage and conviction that he repented of his sins. He was filled with the Holy Ghost, and he was beheaded right along with James. Philip, you know Philip, always the one that asks questions. He was scourged, he was thrown into prison, and afterwards crucified in Phrygia in Egypt. Matthew, you know the tax collector. He was slain with a halberd, it's a sword-like weapon, in the city of Nadaba, Ethiopia. These people went everywhere preaching the word. James, the apostle who wrote the book of James, at the age of 94, was beaten, stoned by the Jews, and then they dashed out his brains with a fuller's club. 94 years old. Matthias, you know, that apostle that got boated in because Judas betrayed Jesus, he was stoned at Jerusalem, and then they beheaded him. Andrew, the brother of Peter, he was crucified on a cross, but have you ever heard of the St. Andrew's cross? It's because he was in a transfixed position, kind of like the X when he was crucified. Mark was dragged to pieces by the people of Alexandria. Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified the same way as his Lord. You know, Paul was beheaded. Jude was crucified. I'm looking at the 12 closest followers to Jesus Christ. Bartholomew was cruelly beaten, and then he was crucified. Thomas preached the gospel in Parthia and India. He was martyred by being thrust through with a spear by pagan priests. Luke was hanged on an olive tree by pagan priests of Greece. Simon Zelotes was crucified in Britain in A.D. 74. Then you got the Apostle John. He was sent to Ephesus for, from Ephesus to Rome, and they put him in boiling oil, and miraculously, he didn't die. 
So Domitian, the emperor, banished him to the Isle of Patmos. It was there he wrote the book of Revelation. He's an old man, and he's on a work gang. And they're just expecting him to die just because of the way that you treat people on a work gang. But then when Nerva, the successor of Domitian, becomes the next emperor, then he recalls him from that isle, and he, he's the only apostle who escaped a violent death. It didn't mean that he didn't suffer. Good news, right? The bad things, that was yesterday. Today's better. Look around us. I, does anybody know anybody that was beheaded recently for the sake of Christ? Does anybody know anybody that was crucified recently for the sake of Christ? It looks like things have gotten a lot easier for us now, right? That persecution was just for Jesus' followers then, right? That's not taking place anymore, right? Let me share another bit of information with you for just a minute. Let me just ask you, if I was to ask you the most persecuted group on the planet today, who would you say? The correct answer, in case you're not sure, is the Christians. Christian persecution is the least reported and the most ignored. The International Society for Human Rights, and that's a secular organization, said 80%, 80% of all religious freedom violations in the world today are directed toward Christians. Well, you know that for 300 years, it was illegal to be a Christian in Rome, and we know how the apostles were martyred, but since the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a little over 2,000 years, 70 million believers in Jesus Christ have died for their faith. People that believe in Jesus Christ, 70 million people. But what surprised me about this statistic is that half of that number, 35 million, have died in the last 100 years. About 100 million followers of Christ living in countries where the state, the prevailing religion, or a dictatorship have Christians facing the threat of discrimination, persecution, interrogation, arrest, imprisonment, torture, or even death. There used to be about 1.3 million Christians in Iraq you're familiar with all that's going on in the turmoil there, there today, there's less than 100,000, 1.2 million less. The most current estimate is that there are 70,000 Christians in prison in North Korea today. If you want to be in a prison, you don't want to be in North Korea. Not that anybody wants to be in a prison. About every five minutes a Christian dies for their faith. Think about that. We've been sitting here since Sister Waddell sang, there's been three more people that have died for being a Christian. All this is reported in a book as well called The Global War on Christians, written by John Allen Jr. There's been research, it is going on. We just don't see it. We live in a blessed nation. We live in a place where it, it may not be happening to us, but, but we have to understand it isn't because persecution isn't taking place. We're shielded from this. But even here, spiritual opposition is growing to Christianity. Even today, America is becoming more secular. And in many ways, it's open season on the followers of Jesus Christ here today in a way that it never was 20 years ago. It may not be outright persecution yet, but it's definitely pressure to conform. It's definitely a lot more pressure to become more ungodly in the way we think and the way we act. I mean, there's always been that pressure to cooperate with an unethical boss, but I think it's a little bit stronger in that now we have situation ethics and no one even wants to. Years ago, everybody at least thought that they wanted to be a Christian. Anymore, they don't even claim that. Pressure to participate in immoral behavior has increased instead of decreased. Pressure to remain silent when others are praising and promoting moral choices and lifestyles that are in opposition to the word of God. I'm talking about reality today. I'm, really t I I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know. You may have even read this. This was yesterday. The LGBTQ students staged walkouts at religious high schools and colleges opposing the Title IX exemption that allows these schools to receive federal funding because they wouldn't endorse LGBTQ rights because they're contrary to their religious beliefs and values. Anybody else read that? Garrett? Just a couple of the others? This is current events. This is happening in our world today. There is pressure to conform. 
And I don't know that there won't be persecution soon. But Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that we should not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed. I don't know about you, but I want to be transformed. I want to be renewed in the spirit of my mind. I want the Holy Ghost to make a difference in me. I want to know that I can speak out with boldness, and I don't have to be a part of a, of a situation in this world where everyone else says submit or at least be silent. You know, sometimes, it, sometimes it, we just have to stand up and we just have to speak the truth. We can do it in love, but sometimes there, there's only so far that we can just remain silent. And there comes a point where we have to let everybody know, no, that's wrong. That's contrary to the word of God. And, and if you want to oppose it, that's fine, but I will not participate in that. I've been in, in, business, I've been in meetings at, at, a, at a college, and they've been there to promote LGBTQ rights and everything else. And, and everything that they said, I was opposed to. And at first, there was something in me that just wanted to kind of like not rock the boat and go along. And then there came a point where I just said, enough's enough. You know, it's, it's like you can't, you can't tell me that this is right when I know it's wrong. But that's where we're living right now. But the power of the Holy Ghost and the power to be a witness hasn't changed. We still have that power to be a witness. And I want to be a light in a world that's getting darker. You know, when, when there's more darkness, that light shines a little bit brighter. It's no time to put that light under, under a, a bushel basket. It's time to let that light shine. But let me ask you, why hasn't our church in America faced persecution? I believe there's two reasons. And the first reason, I think, is pretty good, although that's just my opinion. Our founding fathers intended to establish a place. They came from persecution, and they wanted to have a, a nation that you would not be persecuted because of your choice of religion. They established that right in the Constitution and in the Bill of Rights. And today that right is being challenged and it's being eroded because there are others that are saying our rights should supersede the rights of a Christian. So we know there's a war going on. Now if it goes far enough, then we may find persecution. You know what? Jesus said that when you're persecuted, he didn't say if you're persecuted. He said when you're persecuted. But then the second reason that I believe that the church in America isn't facing persecution right now is one that I'm not necessarily so proud of. And it's one that actually I'm a little bit more concerned about, to be perfectly honest with you. And that's when Christians lose their uniqueness. At one time, everybody in America claimed to be a Christian. Now, as everyone else is changing, the challenge for us is to no longer feel like we can fit in with this world. We still need to understand that there is a unique position for a Christian to stand for truth. When we become so saturated and so involved with the things of this world to the point that no one can tell who the Christians are, then we won't face any more persecution. But we'll be that salt that's lost its savor. And too often American Christians focus on God's blessings and we forget the price that we're supposed to be willing to pay. Now, this is a tough lesson that I'm teaching tonight, but it's a true lesson. God wants us to consider the cost and the dividends. It's more than just the cost, but there's a reward at the end. In Luke chapter 14, verse 27, he said, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Many of the apostles, that was a literal cross. But I think we all understand that we have an obligation as well. He went on to say, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? You don't even say you want to be a Christian if you're not, not going to say, I'm going to get clear to the end. If you aren't willing to give everything, then you might as well not even start this. So I think I'm looking at a group of people that understand that. But sometimes it's all right to just remind us, we're in this for the long haul. And when we get through, it's going to be worth it. Jesus didn't hide this fact from anybody. He just flat out told his disciples there's going to be persecution. And if you're going to be my disciple, then you need to accept, expect it. Jesus told us in this life we should expect persecution instead of praise. I just as soon take the praise. He said you can, should expect cruel insults instead of cordial invitations. Which of those do we tend to gravitate towards? Harassment instead of honor. Abuse instead of applause. Slander instead of support and death instead of dignity. I'm talking about being a Christian. Anybody still happy to be a Christian? I'm still happy to be a Christian, because this message sounds like a message of gloom, but it isn't. Jesus described it as blessed. He told his followers in John chapter 16, verse 33, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. 
That sounds a lot better, doesn't it? In the world you shall have tribulation. He's saying, yeah, it's still going to happen. He didn't deny it. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He's the one that conquered death, hell, and the grave. There isn't anything that he hasn't defeated. And he's also given us the promise of heaven. Our text in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's a pretty good hope. That's a pretty good hope. But let me point out that we're blessed when persecution is for righteousness' sake. Jesus did not say blessed are the people because they get picked on and poked fun of by other people. Jesus didn't say blessed are those that are mistreated because someone doesn't like them or just because someone wants to bully somebody. Those people aren't necessarily blessed. He didn't say blessed are those because you get lied about. He didn't say blessed are the people because, because they're, they're insulted. He just said blessed are the people that are persecuted for righteousness sake so what is righteousness let me remind you a little bit what righteousness is it's God's righteousness and it's not my righteousness Isaiah 64 verse 6 tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags but his righteousness the righteousness that we have because we have repented of our sins we've been obedient to the word of God we've been baptized in the precious name of Jesus and identified with the one that is truly righteous and then his Holy Spirit comes to reside within us to complete that righteousness that can only be in us. And then we continue to live in that righteousness. Righteousness is a life that's lived under the control and the influence of God's Spirit. That's righteousness. Because righteousness is right living according to the understanding and the direction of God. Righteous is not, righteous is not living according to a legalistic standard of do's and don'ts. We talked about that with holiness, but that isn't righteousness and that isn't holiness. God isn't looking for that. God is looking for somebody that from their heart and their desire to please God is saying, God, I want my life to align with you. I want my attitude to align with these beatitudes. I want my spirit to be a spirit that's pleasing to you. I want my words to be acceptable to you. I want my actions to be actions that you're, that you're pleased with. That's true holiness and that's true righteousness. The Christian must the christian should but actually the christian must live differently from the others who are non-believers it's an absolute requirement the values that we have should be different our priorities have to be different our goals have to be different we don't always think about it like that our desires as a christian should say i'm looking at life different from everybody else and i've got a different lifestyle the child of God should kind of stick out like a sore thumb. And as the world gets crazier and crazier, it should be a little easier to identify the Christians. And it should be a little easier to say those are the ones that we want to round up because it's time to persecute them. Because we should be able to stand for this truth. We shouldn't line up to this world or to the American culture that's changing, but we should say, I want to be righteous. And God, if that results in persecution, that's all right, too, because you said it's a blessed life. Living out the Beatitudes in our daily life means that we don't sit on the fence between being a Christian and then trying to tie in the values of this world. We can't do it. And as this world gets crazier, you can only stretch yourself so far, so you're going to have to make a decision. So in a way, it's making it easier for us instead of harder. The building blocks are building blocks to be like Jesus. I don't know about you, but I want to be like Jesus. When we live our life consistent with the attitudes, the characteristics, qualities, and values of Jesus, our life will be different. Let me remind you, Ephesians 2.19 says that we're no longer strangers and foreigners, but we are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. We're living a different life than everybody else. We're blessed. We're blessed, but we're blessed when persecution is not only because of righteousness, but because it's a reaction to Christ in us. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. Anybody have been reviled recently? Anybody just look at you with disgust and hate you because you're a Christian? Persecute you? Say all manner of evil against you falsely? They can't find anything to say that's true, but they start coming up with anybody. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody been persecuted? But not because of what I've done, not because of all the messed up flesh that's me, but because of Jesus Christ and the life that I'm living that's that's tied into him. This Christian faith is it's not a religion. 
And it's not about living that moral or good life, even though that's important as far as righteousness. Christianity really is all about being like Jesus and the relationship that we have with Jesus. If we have that, you know this is the best life. And if you know this and if you really love Jesus, then all the rest really doesn't matter. And the persecution is just something we can take anyway, right? The question is, how deeply do I fall in love with Jesus? How consistently do I live with Jesus? How much of my life is really centered around Jesus? When I wake up in the morning, is the first thing that I think about Jesus. When I go to bed at night, is the last thing that I think about Jesus. What am I doing throughout the day? When I pray, is it because I really want that relationship with Jesus? Do I pray? How much do I pray? Do I study the word because I really want to know more about Jesus? My healing is in Jesus. Our salvation is in Jesus. I want to live my life to be in his presence. Does that make sense? And if we live this way, our attackers will not be attacking us because of our faults or our weaknesses. Now, there may be some things we still got to work out, but really what we're going to find as far as opposition is they're going to persecute us because they really want to persecute Jesus. It's not about you and me. It's about Jesus. You know, Saul did everything in his power to destroy the church. Remember this, Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9? He had believers arrested. He put them in prison. He threatened the lives of the Christians, and he was consenting unto their death. He went so far, he decided to take a road trip and go to Damascus. But he got stopped by the light on his way. And when he did, Acts chapter 9, verse 4 tells us, he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest the Christians? Why persecutest thou me? And he said, well, who am I persecuting? Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. And just in case you missed it the first time I told you, and you're persecuting me, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Saul wasn't opposing a group of people. He wasn't opposing what he thought he was opposing. He was persecuting Jesus. And he was flat out told that. People are continuing to persecute Jesus. The Lord, all those people that are dying today, all those people that are going through all the persecution, they're really persecuting Jesus. The Lord wanted us to remember that when we run up against trouble, it's not about us. Let's always make it about him. That way I don't have to worry about defending myself because they're really attacking him anyway. You know, it's really amazing. It's probably one of the oldest tricks in the book. When when you can't attack somebody personally, you attack their family. You all know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever had family attacked because somebody couldn't get at you the way that they wanted to? I have. And what do you want to do? You want to say, come on, let you and me duke this out and leave my family out of it. Anybody ever say that? Leave my family out of this. And yet, let's remember that when we're being attacked today, that means that What they're really attacking is Jesus because we're the children of God. I don't know about you, but I'm okay being the child of God. I'm okay knowing that if that's the way I feel, leave my family out of it, that if he's going to let me go through something, then at the end he's got a pretty good reward for me as well. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 20, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. He's he's already telling you, you know, If if I'm going to live this life strong enough, then somebody's going to hate me. I'm going to speak the truth in love, and I'm going to be the nicest person I can. But if that makes somebody hate me, that's okay, because they hated Jesus. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. If we were like everybody else, you'd fit in just fine. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they've persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. Then he says something I really like. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. We're going to be hated. We're going to be persecuted because Jesus was hated and persecuted. But as we let our light shine, some will believe. I want to let my light shine in this world today. I want to make sure that I'm making the right impact on my family, on my friends, on my coworkers, on, on, on those around us. I want to make sure that those that will hear have the opportunity to hear and to obey. You know, we're in pretty good company when we're persecuted. Jesus wrapped up that last verse. He said the prophets of the Old Testament were persecuted because they proclaimed the word of the Lord. 
That's okay. I don't mind being in, in company with Isaiah. I don't mind being in, in company with Elijah. You know, those are some pretty impressive people. Let me remind you about Elijah. He thought he was the last man standing for God. He challenged the prophets of Baal. Of course, it was no contest because God answered with fire. You know the story. But then you also know that when Queen Jezebel threatened to kill him, he ran for his life. And not only did he run for his life, but he told God, I'm the only one that's left, and you might as well take my life too, and, and I, I, I can't do this anymore. And then God said, well, not so fast. I actually have 7,000 men who haven't bowed the knee to the image of Baal. You're not alone. You know, sometimes when you're going through the persecution and we're going through this, there may be a time when you, we are, I, I might be the last person that I know, and they put me in isolation in a cell somewhere, and they tell me, you're the last person that's living for God. There's still a great cloud of witnesses. Let me remind somebody. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11 is, is the, the heroes of faith. And we're talking about all these people that gave their life and that were committed. And they saw great miracles take place. And then we turn, it, turn the page over to Hebrews chapter 12. And it says, Wherefore, soon we are also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let me tell you, even if nobody else is watching here on this earth, there's still some... From, from heaven's portals that are looking down and watching. And they're saying, I made it, and you can make it too. Amen. Apostle Paul, you, you were beheaded, and if I'm beheaded, I can make it too. Those others that were crucified, what, whatever the torture, if they made it, they're telling us that we can make it too. So let's lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. The race that is set before us. And just in case you're not sure where to look, look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We just need to keep our eye on the prize. Just keep our eye on the prize. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. We're standing up in the face of persecution and pressure, and it's not easy. But it's easier when we keep the reward in view. Oh, it's a whole lot easier as long as I can keep heaven in, in my sight and remember that really where I'm going is going to be worth it all. I know the price can be extreme. I know today it can still be tough to be a Christian. I know today there's people that are going, I don't know if I can keep up with all this. I mean, we're talking personal rejection. We're talking unjust treatment. We're talking being falsely accused. And there's others today that are being beaten, bruised, betrayed, tortured, and even killed. But I do believe that what we receive is so much greater than what it costs. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our light affliction, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at those things which are not seen yet. For the things which are seen are temporal. They're of this earth. They're temporary but the things which are not seen, they're going to be for all of eternity. So I don't know about you, but rejoice with exceeding joy. In Acts chapter 16, you know the story. Paul was in the city of Philippi. He was overtaken by a mob. He was arrested. He was beaten. They turned him over to the jailer, and he made their feet fast in the stocks, and he locked him up in the deepest part of the prison. I call that persecution. How about you? I wouldn't call that a good day. If that happened to Brother Rick and I, I think we'd be going, mm, things are a little tough for us right now. And most of us would have at least wanted to maybe just say, well, let's try to get through this and see if we can get a little bit of sleep tonight. And maybe tomorrow things have to get a little bit better because I don't think it's going to get too much worse. Right? We'd feel that way. Yet about midnight, you know what happened. Paul and Silas, they weren't sleeping. They weren't singing the blues. They weren't complaining about their bad day. They weren't even comparing how many cuts and bruises one had or the other one had. Instead, we find two sore, uncomfortable, weary, had to be tired men responding to the results of their persecution. What were they doing? They were praying. And then you know what else they were doing? Yeah, that sound you heard was just right. 
They were praising God and singing praises to God. You know what? If they can do that in a prison cell, there's something on Sunday, you know, about 12 o'clock. I think I have a little bit of strength and a little bit of ability to lift him up and to magnify him. And those songs should come a little easier for me because I'm not fighting exactly what they went through. But I want to rejoice with exceeding joy. When we're persecuted, rejoice with exceeding joy. For great is our reward in heaven. Let me remind you, that wasn't the only time. Well, you know the end result. The prisons were shaken and they got out and it looks like that's the time to rejoice. You know, and maybe it was. I'm sure that they rejoiced a lot more at that point as well. Brother Rick, if it was you and me, I'm telling you, I'm going to do the most rejoicing when it's over with. But that wasn't the only time that the Apostle Paul was persecuted. Let me remind you of what he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. He said, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent. I've, I've been a, a jailbird more than anybody else. <laughs> in deaths oft. That sounds like an extreme statement to make until you continue reading what else he said. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. I was beaten five times with 39 stripes. Three times was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep. Didn't even know if I was going to survive. Anybody ever swim for a night and a day, try to survive? In journeyings often, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings oft in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Persecution. He goes on to say, who is weak? And I am not weak. He's saying, I feel every bit of this. I'm not Superman. Who's offended? And I burn not. But if I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. I'm going to glory in these persecutions. If ever a man suffered, it would have had to have been the Apostle Paul. I don't know, but some of us probably would have thrown in the towel, or at least we would have really liked to have figured out a way to go a little easier on it all and maybe back off just a little bit, maybe not be quite so strong as a Christian. You know what I'm talking about? It would have been easy for him to justify just walking away and saying, okay, now it's time for me to retire, and I've done enough. But years later, we find Paul, and he's writing to the church in Philippi, and this time he's in another prison in Rome. And he doesn't know if he's going to get out of this prison. In fact, he probably won't. And he writes some words, and he wrote a lot of good words, and I just want to read one verse, words that still ring of hope for every Christian today. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. He said, church, I just want you to rejoice. But I don't want you to rejoice like everybody else, but I want you to rejoice in the Lord. I want to make sure that you understand that this isn't a rejoicing that you do part-time when everything's going good, but I want you to rejoice in the Lord always. I want you to rejoice in the good times, and I want you to rejoice in the bad times, and I want you to rejoice in those everyday days when it's just life going on as normal. But I want you to rejoice. Make sure you're rejoicing in the Lord. Rejoice always. And just in case you need to know what I really mean with all this, let me give you one last word, and that last word is rejoice. Pretty powerful verse. Stand with me. I'm closing, if you will. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. I don't know about you. I know this is 
a message of persecution. But somehow or another, I just feel like it's a message of rejoicing. Somehow I feel like it's just a, a message of saying, God, you're good. And God, I'm thankful for what you've given. And God, I'm thankful for the opportunity to go to heaven. And there's something within me that just feels a rejoicing spirit. Anybody else feel that way today? Let's just go ahead and let's lift up our hands and let's rejoice in his presence. I love you, Jesus, and I thank you, God, for your goodness. Oh, you're a great God. The joy and the hope, Lord, that you've given to your people. We rejoice in the power of the Holy Ghost. We rejoice in the strength, God, that you've given to us, your people. We rejoice knowing that our hope is in you. Our future rests in you. Everything, God, is going to work according to your will, but it's going to work together for good. You're a great God. You're a mighty God. You're a holy God. We worship you and we praise you today.